the minority leader. Consistently, whenever it rains, mass light takes over the Accra Winima Road, especially the uh, Malam Junction Kasua part. Totally blocks the road consistently, is posing a risk to human life and motorists. The, the roads minister said that they are planning to plant grass. But if you look at the situation there, it's not just a matter of sand winning, it's a matter of spatial planning, it's a matter of lack of, uh, let me say, su supervision and total environmental degradation. What will you do in order to prevent these abuses on that stretch of the road, which becomes a nuisance to motorists and a danger to life and property? The children, I, I have I have happened to encounter or seen that problem first and at least once. So in this sense, the picture you are painting is true. But again, this is a very technical problem. So I want to draw my attention to it. If I get a nod, then we have to make it a project and look at it, where environment comes in, where we have to deploy the appropriate technology to stop this, together with the road ministry, I'm sure that they have the capacity and then we on our side, environment can come in and then of course the technical people can kick in and prefer solutions who can prevent it. I don't think this should be a big problem. Yeah. This is my final one. Living in Accra, I appreciate one very important problem, sand winning, both within inland and at the shore. It's becoming almost an environmental problem for Gun East, Gun South, and those districts. I have no problem with people who undertake that exercise within the law, do the reclamation, cover up and all those things. But many of those instances, they don't adhere to the law, the regulation. They just win the sand and win the sand and cause environmental problem. You're also in charge of technology. Is there a possibility, can we be looking at as, as a country, building without really affecting our environment and taking away the sustainability of the ecosystem. Well, if you can repeat the last, you, you built a preamble, but I had a preamble, but the question I didn't quite get. I'm saying in certain parts of the world, there has been technological advancement, innovative ways of building without necessarily impacting negatively on the ecosystem, that the sun winning and all those things. But it looks like with us, every aspect of our building. Are we thinking about new methods? Since you are going to the Minister of Environment and Technology, Science, Science Innovation and Technology, innovative ways, technological ways that we can look at building without necessarily causing damage to the sustainability of our environment. Mr. Chairman, I believe that his question is very loaded indeed. Yes, when we are building, we have to use earth materials, whether mud, whether sand, and even if you are going to use wood, these are all natural materials. And in bridge there, you have to have a sustainability plan. So sustainability is how to replace the materials, or even if they are irreplaceable, how to mitigate their impact on the environment so that the impact 
on the human person is limited in terms of health and even aesthetics, say beauty and whatnot. So to answer you directly, yeah, there have to be a mixture of all the propositions that are made. And you throw in technology. Is that technology is the how, the know-how that will lessen all those things. So you choose the appropriate technology so that all the mitigating things are done. I believe that in this country we have. So yes, we are going to win sand. Now when you win sand, how do you do the necessary restitution? You can even re really, after winning the sand, you can win back the soil. You can build the soil so that even you can plant things there. Those are the things that must be done. Mr. Chairman, my take is that in Ghana, we expect those who win science to do the restitution. My take on this is, is that in several sectors, this does not happen. If you take the timber industry, those who harvest our timber, they are not interested in planting trees. If you take say, the gold and mining industry, those who did, they are not interested in being the environmental institution covering the big holes, the craters that they create. The same thing, those who dig the land and win sanctions. So my proposition is that we set up entities with the requisite knowledge in this particular case under the local government system. Or it can even be under the land and natural resources ministry take the requisite amount of money from these people because these are economic businesses. And those experts then do the necessary restitution. If you ask those who are winning science, and they will not be. So there are levies and what not which should cause them and we should look at the bigger picture and cause them well. And then the right price. Because a lot of what is bringing all this problem is the phenomenon of free right in this country. When I talk free right, it means the actual cost, a lot of uh, things which are for the public good are undercosted, and the, their economic value are less than. And that's why. So people, actuaries and what not you, and those in, in the building industry should cost all those things. And then the environmental damage that is caused, and that is caused, we can have a cost to it. Take it give it to entities that have been set up with expertise, those with the requisite expertise, so that they can do this restitution. You, I bet you, we cannot count on those who win the science to do the necessary restitution. Unfortunately, their knowledge even in that area is very, very limited indeed. So that is my take on that. Thank you. Yes, Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Honorable Dr. Kwekwefi, I congratulate you on your nomination. I've been reviewing sections 13 and 14 of the Environmental Protections Act 1994 and 490. And I've reviewed it in relation to uh, enforcement of spillage and environmental degradation and other such offenses under the Act. Now, from my review, I see that the offense for any kind of offense under the law is 250 penalty units. That is about 3,000 Ghana cities. Well, the penalty unit is 12 cities. Now, this is not Definitive enough. At best, what an offender will do is to add 3,000 cities to his course of operations, knowing very well that I'll be charged 3,000 cities. That's the maximum. And then go ahead, do anything, degrade the environment and the consequences thereof. Would you consider an amendment to the EPA Act to give some bites? to the enforcement regime under the, under the Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yes, penalty units, by the way, if I want to train something, 
uh, is called Prejoin in the Omanese Palace. Uh, so 3,000, what did you say? 2,500? 250, that means Prejoin 250. Anyway, that is by the way, I just to educate, for our own education. Uh, Prejoin is about now 8 weeks <laughs> also. What, what, uh, but uh, that the concept of penalty units even existed before us. Uh, so that is what I want to bring to the fore. But, uh, Chairman, what I'm saying is that that is absolutely, I could not disagree with him. That is absolute. So the law is a function of time. So these allies, we have to review them. One, as a minister, one of my mandates is to review their legal environment and then bring it to a, you know clear of course with my superiors and then bring it to the uh, uh, parliament so that the necessary uh, you know uh, corrections are done so this answer is very straightforward you are right and that i was referring to the phenomenon of free right in our, uh, the economics here the, uh, those who done economics they know this is what engenders free right. You see, the value between, the difference between this uh, 3,500 and then the actual cost is <laughs> the marginal cost of that free right. So we can capture it. So I agree with you. Thank you. And then we build it, we build it into the uh, penalties. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ghana is a signatory to the Bamako Convention on the ban of imports of hazardous waste in Africa. Now, if you review the convention, you see that the provisions practically deal with everything that has to do with import of hazardous waste and the punitive regime. Now, I have been searching all over the place to see whether the convention has been domesticated pursuant to Article 75 of the 1902 Constitution into our domestic laws to see whether it has been so that we can enforce it in Ghana and then prevent people from bringing hazardous waste into the country. Can you take steps to see to the implementation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This can be done very expeditiously. That's the very essence of signing on to conventions. If I may give an analogy and a parallel, we signed on the FCTC Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in Geneva. I was then the chairman of the WHA. And quickly, one of the consequences was that we have to pass a in country uh, legislation to make it sure that people do not smoke in public places. Ghana did it in double quick time. And uh, uh, so I have an idea about what to do. So as soon as I'm giving the nod, thanks for averting, averting my mind to that. It, it shall be done. Your Honor. Yeah. 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 Honorable Zoera. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Honorable Nomi. My question has to do with uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics training for the youth. As the world evolves, different skills will be required of the youth so that they can remain competitive in the world market. I want to find out what your plans are to ensure more training of STEM for the youth so that they can be part of the changing world that we are seeing every day. Again, Mr. Chairman, the last, if she will indulge me, the last end of the question. You want to find out from me? I want to find out from you. If, if you get the nod as Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, what will be your plans? to ensure that there's more STEM training for the youth of this country so they can be competitive and relevant to the changing world that we're experiencing. The need for STEM 
training is very, very um, uh, self-evident. In fact, society thrives on STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. No society can progress without that. So, as for the need, is well established. But the plans that we have to draw to make sure, first, it starts with even education. Because if the society does not understand that STEM is the platform in which all our actions should play out, to make us competitive, to give us a modern society, if we do not invite that, if there is no acculturation, if you do not accept that, all plans will not work. As for the specific plans, we have to look at the numbers. How many of the youth are in, you know, STEM environment? And then we have to draw plans, know our objectives, know the deficit in terms of numbers, in terms of quality, in terms of quantities and then draw the plans that will address this. But I believe that it must start with acculturation. And indeed, every youth, up to a certain level, should have a background in these four disciplines. Even if you are an arts student, because everything, technology thrives on this uh, you know, uh, uh, science is trying, it thrives, engineering and technology, which are derivatives of the basic sciences, they thrive on all these things, science and mathematics. So everybody should have a working knowledge and appreciate that this is good for society. And then we go into specifics. That is where we should decide that maybe at the secondary school level, secondary level, maybe 80% or 60% of our students should be goaded towards that area. And then at the tertiary level, in my mind's eye, at least half of our population, the courses that are being offered should be in that area. That is the only way our society is going to progress. But it takes national dialogue and national conversation creation of awareness to get to that stage is going to be a very difficult task. Well, my four-year mandate, if I get the acculturation thing right, like it's happening in Western Europe, the Americas, and even places like Iran and India, where these things are appreciated, I'm sure will be all off to a very good start, madam. Yes, I'll give you one more. Yes, thank you very much. The other question is on research. There's a general decline in research in Ghana. And as you know, research actually is the bedrock of any society or community that will make progress. So in the event that you get the nod, what will you do? What will be your immediate plans? to make sure that research is inculcated, especially to working with our higher uh, institutions of learning, to make research part of the curriculum, a very serious and um, 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 enduring part of the curriculum so that our country can benefit from new knowledge to prepare our development. Again, we have no choice here. Research is the limiting of industrial development. And research, there is the basic research and then there are applied research. Ghana is not an island. And there me there's something called scientific morality. We have a duty to contribute to the body of knowledge in the world. So even in the basic sciences, we have to do research. But even in the, it is even more important in the applied realm. That is where the economic benefits come in. And again, 
all our institutions, we have to get the institutions uh, to build that kind of capacity. But one of the findings that I made now is that a lot of research is going on. And indeed, Ghana has made some contribution as far as our, uh, let's say, West Africa even is concerned. But the people are not aware of them. Let's take even planting for food and just for example. People do not know that about 95% of the maize that is being grown and which has led to increase in yields and increase in productivity is coming from the research done by CSIR. So you hear the Ministry of Agriculture has done well. But the research on the opinions are never broadcast to the Ghanaians so that they do not appreciate it. Because maize we are doing over tamper. We are doing uh, what we call it, the various varieties. Hardly do you find the primary, the old variety being planted now. Even let's come to our own cocoa. See, uh, the uh, Cocoa Research Institute has done a lot in the cocoa area. That's one area I know best. That is why Ghana has been able to hold its own in spite of so many things, disease and all, that at least we are very competitive in the world of cocoa production. If you take Brazil, they are a net importer of cocoa, even from Ghana, because Bahia, Eastern Brazil, not Eastern Brazil, was devastated by which is bloom disease. If you take Malaysia and other things, Paul Berra disease, uh, 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 no, they, they, they were afflicted. Their scientists could not stop them in any big way. But we have held our own. We've researched and CSIR and its uh, institute, Crop Research, uh, you know, Coco is at Bunsu and elsewhere, and Tafu and others. We have been able to give us varieties that can resist uh, CSSVD. So we have a lot of things going for us, but they are, they are not known to the Ghanaian public. So the idea that we, are, we have positive in the research arena, we must question it. We have done quite a lot. But of course, I will be the first to admit that we should be doing a lot more. And as a, a, a doctor of a, a public health, the neglected tropical diseases, nobody is going to solve them for us. I'm talking about the large vestiges of elephantiasis, onchocerciasis, and this. Those in the West, they are not interested in them anymore because they are of no economic importance. But we owe it to our people to research into them so that we can eliminate them. And that will be our contribution to the world. So, because so long as there are reservoirs in the world, they are a threat to everybody. So my idea about research is that, yes, this is, is going to take decades to build. But at least a beginning should be made. And be a minister alone, I cannot. Certainly, having been away from that arena for long, I need to go and immerse myself in it, be at par on the same page with my, you know, scientific, the scientific Thank community you, out there. Minister. And be able to do what you yeah, are. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought you called me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On Thursday, 24th June 2020, Accra experienced three F tremors. Overall, between January 2018 and June 2020, the city has experienced about eight earth tremors. Officials of the Ghana Geological Survey Authority are on record to have warned that the earth tremors is a signal of a looming earthquake of greater magnitude in the future. I know a committee was formed to develop a comprehensive framework for earthquake preparedness and response. As the Minister designate for Environment, Science and Technology, what will be your contribution to ensuring 
we are able and ready as a nation to protect lives and properties should there be an earthquake in the future. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Geological Survey Department comes under the purview of lands and uh, natural resources ministry. But that said, through EPA, because there is intertwining of a mandate between Mesty and the like, so it's not like I want to avoid the question. But certainly, I have to collaborate with my colleagues so that the plans and whatnot that you have alluded to, they are brought to the fore. Whatever input Mesty as a ministry has to make into it is expedited so that we have that prepared net in place. Certainly, the way you put the question is going to, it means an uh, intersectorial collaboration how to be engendered because NADMO and others also will have to kick in. So, thanks for drawing my attention. I have to look in that area. Having not had my mind to that, let me confess. But I will certainly uh, look at that area when I get them. Thank you. Your, your CV shows you served as a member of the National Development Planning Commission. And you also led the National Health Insurance Scheme introduction as the Minister for Health. In fact, from concept to legislation to implementation, you are credited for the efforts that you, you made, and I want to commend you. Um, should you become the Minister for Environment, Science and Technology, what specific legacy or projects do you want to leave um, at the sector? Legacy. It's more for me, for me, with all humility, to talk about legacies now. Let me get over this hope. But I tell you, uh, I've always described myself as a fighter. One thing that I've been thinking of is, in all humility, recommend to my president that maybe he should be thinking of a, a, a decade of innovation. A decade of innovation for this country. Because mesty, when we talk about innovation, there are so many facets of it. So if you have a, a national dialogue, even innovation in the arts, the president has done a lot of things that people might not even realize. Even the cultural setting. This it started as Friday where people used to put on a look, look up at a fabric soon. Now is the norm. If you put in a jacket, you look like you are gradually even becoming an outcast. That is innovation, a mass innovation. But even me, I will be in the scientific arena. So we should have a desk which makes sure that science, technology, and innovation in all the sectors, somebody who will be looking at their work plans, their programs, and make sure that is what is the best way of doing this. Let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, one small anecdote. Even as I speak to you now, the conventional wisdom is that you do not plant cocoa seedlings in the dry season. I have stood conventional wisdom on its head, and I'm doing cocoa ray planting in the dry season. I've noticed that when you do cost-benefit analysis, and I water my seedlings, and I plant them in rows and lines, and I water them. One determinant, that's the growth of, you know, weeds. I'm able to control them, and I'm able to focus the water to the roots of the, the seedlings. So they grow faster. And by the time we come to the next rainy season, I will be up and running and I will have less mortality. I've done all the costing. So what I want to say is that that is innovation, even at my personal level. But we have to do things. We have to challenge conventional wisdom about how to do things. We are so much embedded 
and married to culture. Some cultures are very good, cultural elements are very good, but there are certain things that we have to bring in innovation and come in quick so that our economy will grow and we will prosper as a nation. And so that is what I want to be brought to for that. It's not a new thing, I did not invent it, but somebody who brought it to the fore that the nation buys into it. But that is, these are early days yet. The innovation thing at Mesty must be taken seriously. And it cuts across all sectors. That is why I used even the social sector as an example and not the science sector. Thank you. Finally, um, you are a great expert in the cocoa sector. And I am a son of cocoa farmers. In the village, in the Honorable Eric Kokoku will bear me out. When is the cocoa season? Farmers' welfare and living standards are good. But during the off season or the, the lean season, farmers go through a lot of hardship in terms of their economic living standards. What innovations can we do about the cocoa sector, the product, the cocoa product? so that we can have either a year-long harvest of cocoa or extra products that can be developed from either the leaves or the pod or whatever to give much more income to improve the welfare of cocoa farmers. As a chairman, cocoa is a perennial crop and its fruition is limited by the seasons. If you mitigate, you do micro, then you, you get the elements correct. You can harvest cocoa throughout the season. That's why Cocoa Board is even doing pilot irrigation and whatnot. They work. So, well, as head of uh, Mesty, uh, I will collaborate with my colleagues in Agric. And we have had inform we had informal sector, but I believe one other thing too. We have a problem in where I come from, CSSBD, cocoa swelling shoot virus disease. It's a disaster. Production has slumped from about 350,000 metric tons to 150, as I speak now. But it presents an opportunity. Mr. Chairman, Ghana has mimicked or copied monocrop farming. We have an opportunity to do mixed farming or intercropping. So it's an idea I will not pretend to be uh, a better, uh, you know, more agriculturist than uh, in the, the agriculturists. They have the knowledge. But I can tell you that personally I've been doing mixed cropping. And I noticed that CSSVD does not it, it uh, affect my cocoa trees. For example, I intercrop cocoa with nutmeg and then black pepper and then uh, 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 there used to be rubber species in some of the land that I acquired. I've left them some standing and even the, the indigenous rubber that uh, uh, Ufuntum when you leave all these things and you, uh, you, you, you can have, you can harvest them and get income all throughout. So right now I earn per acre basis, I earn more from not milk than cocoa. In fact, about 15 times. A bag of cocoa will give me 660 Ghana cities. But not milk, they come from Techiman to come and buy. It's about 9,000 Ghana cities. So, uh, 9,000 Ghana cities per bag. Per bag. Not milk. Not milk. Oh. So, we have a lot of things to do. And you see, the researchers, they will do. But monocropping is good, but we have an opportunity. That is why my colleague, we, we can pilot them at least, or even do some things like that. I believe that we are grappling with CSSVD because of monocropping. If we had to do a mix and integrated, I mean, in fact, I left a coconut. I also plant coconut. 
So when you do that, you may, pick, you may make the tropical environment and diseases and infestations are minimized. So there are a lot of things that we can do to we farmers who can then earn a lot of uh, uh, income. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee. Yeah. Plastic waste is a menace in Ghana to the point that fishermen are now harvesting plastic waste instead of fishes. What policy direction will you give to ensure that plastic waste is not a challenge to Ghana? The chairman, plastic waste, <laughs> there will always be a challenge, but we have to manage it well. If we don't want it to be a challenge, then we have to ban it. But that is not on the radar because we can also argue the benefits from plastics. So, first of all, we have to apply technology. The sheer volumes must even be reduced. In recent times, and thanks to the advocacy of Professor Fempom Wati, you see that even the package, the water bottles, they have been reduced, uh, you know, the manufacturer, they have used the, the quantum, the weight has been reduced drastically, and yet they serve, serve the same purpose. So it means the quantities must be brought down. Then, of course, our recycling effort must also be up. So we have to get, and we have an idea, it's not like we have to get. We have an idea about the quantum of plastics that enters this country. And then we know that there is an existing technology to recycle plastics. The problem, though, is the management system and then the economics. When you recycle, at what cost and what, what and then what will it take for somebody not to throw away the plastics, but indeed put it in uh, designated places or uh, you know, collecting centers. Those are the problems that we must solve. But I noticed that Messi has done a lot of things in that arena. There's a policy document there they have put in place. We've gone beyond policy. And, and there are programs and, in fact, even a, a pilot project which is on stream. And as for the economic thing, that is the funding. They have put in place, Messi has put in place a system where funds will be available to make sure that these programs can be carried out. So, Madam, yes, we have the capacity and where we are to recycle plastics. The solution really is recycle. But built in the uh, economic and social problems that I always pivot to. And that is where we have to direct our energies to. The technology even to do recycling, as we know, is, is very, very, the various technologies abound. What would be suitable for our uh, uh, you know, environment, we can do that. So, I believe I have to review the literature, we have to review the, pro, the programs, the policies, where there are deficits, we will come back if necessary to this house so that the necessary institution is done. Thank you. Yes, I'm grateful, Honorable Chair. Congratulations, Doc. My first concern is to do with climate change, first one to Sustainable Development Goal 13, and in line with Ghana's agenda of promoting climate change, one given the note, what leadership will you provide for combating climate and its impact? Well, climate change, there are several facets to it. 
Ghana, as we know, as a geographical entity, is a small country, and indeed, when you distapose it to other countries, we are a small contributor to what is happening to our, you know, as far as climate change is concerned. That said, we still do contribute. And then, on the other hand, even more important is the impact on this. Those who pollute the earth, the impact does not respect boundaries. So we must set up systems to mitigate their effect. That is why we must learn how to live with the climate change. Because if there is drought, then also it will affect the whole of West African sub-region and not Ghana. And we cannot go to war with <laughs> the big countries because they have brought us here. So we must tell our, our policies, our efforts, and even invoke technology to address some of these issues so that we survive as a nation. And I'm talking about technology. We have to use, for agriculture, for example, we have to use climate smart mechanisms. The previous speaker asked me about how we were going to earn income and whatnot. They are all inbuilt there. They are climate smart mechanisms so that we can combat drought. If, for example, if I may give a specific example, CSIR, I know they've reset into rice that can res resist drought, rice species. So if uh, the rainfall pattern changes, uh, depending upon the geographic area, we can use those species and promote them among our farmers. So there are so many aspects of things that we, we can do, but we must do to mitigate the effects of climate, but we have to scale them up and know those that are good in our situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Doc. Uh, my second concern is to do with funding of research and innovations. My I'm a major university of mines and technology and can USD year on year undertake career fairs and innovation fairs where young brilliant tertiary students exhibit their inventions in technology which cut across various sectors of the economy. At the end of the day these brilliant inventions end at the exhibition for lack of funding to take it to the next level. One given the not doc, will you consider it needful to drive private sector robust funding and investment to develop such inventions that are being carried out across our technology tertiary institutions? Thank you. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. I have already flagged that there's a huge gap between research and industrial and agricultural applications. And that is because those entities have not made, so to speak, the appropriate noise for the Ghanaian populace to know that they are, again, to use local parents, they are there. So as a minister, I believe that to bring, it, uh, if I brought to the fore the capacity, the knowledge base, that's research institutes, and, and by uh, extension, the examples that we cited, what schools, even uh, secondary or, uh, you know, schools have been able to do and excite the Ghanaian populace. I believe that people will be more inclined to put money there. But more importantly, this thing should be economically driven. If you marry industry with research, and people can manufacture things in a very, very, you know, economic way, economical ways, then they are more inclined to support, they will be more inclined to support research. But of course, this thing will not happen spontaneously. So government and, in a sense, so the ministry to make sure that there is a C fund for this kind of activities. And the ministry 
the way I see it, should be at the forefront, very industry, the private sector for this kind of activity. So I have every intention to do that when I become the minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee, um, somewhere in September 2020, the World Bank published a paper titled Balancing Economic Growth and Depletion of Natural Resources. And in that paper, it is estimated that in Ghana, environmental degradation costs $6.3 billion annually, or nearly 11% of Ghana's 2017 GDP. That makes environmental degradation issues in Ghana a very serious one. The Yale University also in 2020 published what they call the EPI, which ranked Ghana as 168 out of 180 countries in terms of robust activities to deal with environmental degradation. Honorable nominee, what contribution would your ministry do to reduce the environmental impact of Galamsey activities when approved? Well, the preamble suggests a wider sector about environmental degradation. And in my mind's eye, Galamsey is one big activity, but it's not the only culprit. So if I were to go by your preamble, we have a long discourse, but let me stick myself to the Galamsey that you have cited. Indeed, Galamsey has been with us for a long time. Even history, you go to where I come from, there are pits right in the middle of the forest. So people have harvested gold from the bowels of the earth since millennia. But it was with the introduction of heavy earth moving equipment that the menace became very, very serious. And indeed, there was one empirical legislation. In retrospect, I believe that it was wrong. 1989, mining with heavy earth moving equipment, small scale mining, was legalized. And that was the bane of Ghana's environmental problems. That was the beginning of the menace that were in here. If you want to mitigate it, again, I see solace in the fact that it should be multifactorial or sectorial approach involving society. But first, we must even educate ourselves and know the nature of the problem because it is about a balance sheet situation. There are certain communities, if you step there, you want to abolish that I'm saying, you'll be chased out. If you go to Amenfi East, those of us who, I know every inch of the Western region. Mr. Chairman, permit me a little bit. What's up for 30, 20, 30 years ago, a very, very nondescript time. Now it's an urban sprawl built largely on the back of small-scale mining, legal and illegal. Large swathes of that community, if you went there and told them that you want to abolish Galamsey, you have a big problem. Due to certain areas in Takwa, Christia, and so on. 
So we must have an honest discussion what we want. Because governments upon government upon government since that 19, epochal 1989 uh, proclamation or enactment have tried to stop that st uh, stem that tide without any solution inside. If I may prefer some solutions. First, technology, we must roll it back. Two, we must have a national dialogue and say that our generation is becoming perhaps too selfish. The gold in the bowels of the earth in Ghana does not belong to our generation alone. So we must regret it severely. So if I may use the Wasa Amefi is example, we should have a law that says that based on the available resources that we have, perhaps no more than 50 square kilometers should be mined at any point in time. I'm using that as an example. Just like we, we regret frequency moderation in this country, because we cannot allow everybody to set up a radio station in Accra, right? So we have not addressed that question. It looks like the Minerals Commission and other regulatory bodies, once there's a fine, then it means you, you, uh, people can go and mine. Then, so we can develop the argument. Then I have this idea that earth moving equipment in mining areas must be severely regulated and must be tied to the all fight there. For example, again, my Mephi is, I'm not targeting them. Example, if they are going to do only, if, if, if there are about 20 mining sites, then maybe there shouldn't be any more than, let's say, 20, 25 excavators should be regulated. But even more importantly, we should make, have a census of excavators in this country, and we should even consider a temporary ban on them. Because when we bring the excavators to this country, what are they going to do? I have con contacted my engineering friends, and they have an idea how many excavators we need in the road sector, for example. You take it from the population of excavators in this country, it means they are all destined towards the small-scale factor. So we should have a census, decommission some of them, sell off them off, and then put a ban on their importation and by attrition get the numbers that we can use to do mining, small-scale mining. Remember, I told you that we should regulate even the quantum that we are going to mine. And then, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me, there is one particular equipment in that chain of operation called a uh, washing plant. If you go to Asiapa, if you go to uh, 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 Bogosu, if you go to Tapa, by the roadside, people, electrical engineers and blacksmiths, they are manufacturing those washing plants. They are for single purpose use and they are distinct towards the uh, water bodies. So we should criminalize the unlicensed manufacture of washing plants. Because you know that that washing plant is going to be used to do garamsey in water bodies. And they should be put at the assembly so those who have been licensed to do, they take special permits so that it can be manufactured for them. So these are, once you put on these impediments in the way, and you, solve, you sell the idea to Ghanaians that our generation is not entitled. And that maybe over the next decade, we are entitled to only maybe uh, 50, uh, 10, uh, whatever, 1,000 uh, fine ounces of the gold fine. And we are leaving the rest for our grandchildren. Then we will have the reason there to the, the basis for action. Until we do that, I know all our actions will end in failure. And of course, the criminal aspect, we just passed a law. Nobody has been put in the dock and sent to prison. We were here when you were said that if you, you, you somehow you fell far of the law in certain aspects, you could go to jail for 25 years. I'm yet to hear of anybody. 
So when we combine all those things, this environmental degradation and the contribution there from, from Galaxy will be severely assuaged and this country will be the better for it. So that's why, but I do not prefer to know all this knowledge. This is a personal thing that I'm bringing to the fore. But when I go to the ministry, I'll bring all these things for consideration. There are better experts out there. So that is that. Thank you. All right, honorable nominee, my second question has to do with um, environmental officers and enforcement of environmental standards. I realize that most of the environmental challenges we have is as a result of lack of enforcement of environmental laws at the assembly, district assembly and municipal assembly levels. When we were kids, we used to have, uh, is it town council? which we used to call Tangasi. And those times living at a, a new town, anytime you hear that Tangasi is coming or somebody is coming around, it's always uh, the time that everyone wants to enforce standards around. Are you considering a collaboration with the local government ministry and various MMDAs to reintroduce uh, the local environmental uh, officers to enforce environmental standards as a way of improving our environment? Well, we have evolved. So the tanker's concept exists in its modern form. But I get from you is that we must enforce the laws. That was why I have been hammering on sociology education. If the people do not accept it, it won't work. So we have to educate ourselves. So I agree with you, but maybe not in the old pre-colonial or post-colonial, immediate post-colonial tank council methodology. Those things will not work now. So in which way would you make it work now? Well, I will have a couple of suggestions to make to the local government uh, ministry because those things, they are within its ambit. But there's one thing that I want to say, I've been discussing with people, the EPA is an enforcer, it's an implementer, it's certain as well an enforcer. And it seems to me, reading the literature, that it was set up in an adversarial situation in position to several government agencies. So, we have to collaborate with the agencies, yes, I'm not uh, invoking, uh, uh, bringing in any radical ideas, but I want to say that I want to see the old case where the EPA, upon the intransigence of the Mineral Minerals Commission, and after getting all the clearances that I can, the EPA can then put the Minerals Commission or Forestry Commission in the dock for infractions, persistent infractions. That is my, the limit to which I can go. But the others that you are citing, they belong to another ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, don't know what Brian Chung. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, Nomini. Uh, this question is more on science, technology, and innovation. Seeing that you've answered a lot of questions on the environment. Um, Nomini, NASA just landed a Perseverance rover on Mars. As a country, we are grappling with basic problems of identification and waste management. Now, the fact is that if you look at the space race, if we don't get there within the next 30 years, we won't find space by the time we get there thereafter. The question, is there a space policy being pursued by the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation? And if there is, are you going to work to ensure that within these four years, at least something will lift off the ground, even if we don't get anywhere, so that we have hope that we are going to pursue a space agenda. Thank you. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. Ghana, like the rest of Africa, should be interested in space. It is not an exotic thing. In fact, most of the things that 
comes from space exploration and the technologies that lead to it have application on uh, terrestrial earth. A good example is <laughs> mobile telephony. And like I've said, even if we've made the basic sciences our contribution, at least there are applications we should be interested in because space has application in meteorology. So if you want to do precision meteorology, how to make better forecast weather and all that, we should be interested in space exploration. It doesn't mean that we are building our own rockets and whatnot. There are a lot of satellites out there which can provide them with the data and whatnot. And of course, we should be having uh, receiving stations, so to speak. That is why I come to say here, a beginning has been made. The Ghana uh, space, uh, the Afro, the, that observatory, it was commissioned by the president himself. That is a beginning. So we must not think that space exploration and their derivatives therefore are an exotic phenomenon which should be led left to the developed world alone. As we speak now, you know that a small country like UAE has set an, an object into space and is going to explore a mass. Even now, we are in uh, Martian space. Ghana certainly can compare itself to United Arab Emirates, if even we do not, we are not as wealthy as they are at least population-wise, land size and whatnot. So we should be very interested. But we can also do that in collaboration with our neighbors. That is why Ghana, Côte d'Ivoire, Nigeria, we can get our act together. And in collaboration, we can get some of these things going. So yes, as a minister, I will explore these possibilities. And if there is a niche area that Ghana can express itself, Ghana can express itself. We shall do that. Okay, I, I have a specific question. Do we have a space policy? Yes, there is. There are rudiments, or they are not rudiments. They, I know that there are space policy, but it has. It is within the confines of MESTI. So we have to. The draft policies are there. Is there a roadmap to ensure that? we and our partners are in space at some point, and if so, what is that point? Last week, I did not get the last one. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Is there a road map to get us into space at some point, and if so, what is that point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of that. I have to find out. It's not everything. I'm going there. And let me confess that it's not everything that has come. There could be, but honestly, I do not know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I'm most grateful, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take the nominee to COVID-19 response and how, like no other time, COVID has reminded us that science, research, and development must lead and we must invest massively. Clearly, countries that invested in R&D are doing better in developing a vaccine and uh, having the facilities, the testing kits and all of that, the basic infrastructure to fight the pandemic. We have still not met the AU target of 1% uh, of GDP for research and development. 
how can you take advantage of the times we are in and scale up support, uh, not only government resource allocation, but also mobilizing resources from non-state actors so that as a country we can begin to invest more aggressively in research and development, meet the 1% target uh, of, of GDP, which has eluded us uh, for, for years now, and, uh, and build a strong capacity to be led by science. Mr. Chairman, the need for a very robust research and development system it's so self-evident that I believe that the advocacy for it will register on the Ghanaian public. The question is funding. And like the Honorable Committee member said, I'm aware, or like he, he has availed my mind to the fact that under the Lagos protocols, government should at least set aside 1% of their GDP per annum to do research and R&D activities. So, as a, and indeed, my predecessor has brought, I'm aware, that we sent to cabinet a document which has been approved that at least 1% of our annual budget, our GDP, should be spent in the R&D sector. When I go out, find out whether, if it needs legislative backing, then I intend bringing it as fast as possible to this House, so that it has a legal backing. In fact, I prefer that option because it will then uplift all government and we will all be, we all sign to it. Either government will succeed itself or a different government succeeding a different government. So that should be one of my mandates. So a beginning has been made and have cited detailed proposal in the policy document and, and, and so we have to find out whether there are elements of legislation that have been made. If that has, then I will speed it up and bring it, uh, you know, send it to cabinet and then bring it to this. Now, of course, that decision will have to be made by the president in consultation. And if it's going to be done by an executive fiat too, then it means that the pathway then will be very short indeed then I have to prevail on my superiors because we have a, we are running a four-year, you know, electoral cycle. It's done as soon as possible. But more importantly, this one, the sustainability question will come in when industry itself appreciates the importance of R&D. And in that one, I have made several references to it, even in questions that have been asked before. So, the private sector will have to be brought on board through several regimes. I noticed that, Mr. Chairman, the even 1% is on the low side because places like South Korea and elsewhere, they are doing 2% or 1.5% of their GDP. But that is another matter. Even 1%, we have to read them. So we we'll take that first step and I'll make the advocacy for it to be about even what the Lagos Protocol recommended. Thank you. Related to that, Mr. Chairman, is the amazing innovations that have come up during this COVID era in Ghana, local innovation. I have a few listed here. KNUST and INCAS Diagnostics. They have developed rapid test kits uh, waiting for FDA approval. You have the Redbird Health Tech Company, 
that's developed a sophisticated diagnosing app. You have Professor Fred bagon and his students at Academic City College who have developed an affordable ventilator. You have Team Marvel that won an award, uh, Patients Norte, Nelly Apete, and Ishmael Asari for developing ventilators. You have uh, Dr. Emil, Emeline Opoku, who also has developed a diagnosis mobile app for health workers. You have Cognate Systems, that has also developed a, a special health assistance app. And the list goes on and on and on. But you talk to all of these innovators, and they say that they are not receiving support. If approved, how can you reach out to these amazing innovations that have come up in these times so that you can give them the needed government backing by way of policy, by way of resources, to have it commercialized? Because it will not only help us in developing our scientific capacity, it also has industrial and job creation opportunities. How can you assure this committee that you reach out to all of these local innovators who are winning international awards, making waves, but don't seem to be getting the needed governmental support? Mr. Chairman, innovations engendered by COVID many in the African continent, so many everywhere. And Ghana is no exception. The examples that we have cited exist. Yes, but there are problems with applicability. So specifically, what you tend to do is to have a, a team of members who a scientists who will evaluate their applicability of these innovations. Because we have to get a certain criteria that these innovations will satisfy so that they can be helped. Because the bottom line is that there should also be an economic criteria. Because if the innovation does not bring economic benefits, then in essence it belongs to the basics. It means this thing is possible. But if you are talking, you have to look at applicability. Then the other aspect of it, of these innovations and diagnosis, or the technical innovations in terms of uh, uh, equipment and then diagnosis, is that intellectual property protection is very, very weak in this country. So we have to up it and look at that regime so that anybody who brings an idea to the fore, his intellectual property is not stolen. If you do not do that, people might not bring to one. In fact, it's a very a big moral and ethical issue, so we have to look at it. Especially when I'm thinking of calling for a decade of innovation in this country. So thank you, it has brought to the fore, but certainly, in a very small way, COVID, that one, you do not, COVID has not, the, uh, the, the routine laws and routine regimes, COVID, you, you wave them aside. So, so we have a small team to look at them, and those that have potential, by all means, we look at those things and make sure that they are applicable in the Ghanaian situation. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to pick the nominee's thoughts on climate change. Uh, yesterday, the United States returned to the Paris Climate Change Accord under President Biden. Uh, the climate change debate, there are as those who belong to the developing countries school of thought who say that we have to be measured with our targets and, and how we, we pursue climate change goals. Because the, our developed 
counterparts did not have these climate change limitations and allowed them to industrialize, and they are now at a particular pedestal, and that we should be mindful how we follow them at this point in our development. Where, where do, you, do you stand? Uh, are you with those who are a bit more skeptical and say that let's uh, develop first and, and be a bit mindful about the climate change uh, research outcomes? Or you think that we should leapfrog and we should uh, confront the reality of climate change and uh, go along with the developed world and uh, be more uh, aggressive at adapting to the climate change threat. I want to know where you stand in, in this debate and where we can expect you as the policy leader uh, on this matter, if nominated, which direction you will move this country. Sir Chairman, implicit in the question is the idea that this, uh, this climate change issue is a binary issue. It is not. A whole lot of conversation and science is in there, built through the millennia. Those are, have developed. Those countries, yes, they had a free ride and used their well resources to get to where they are. And we are here. And they are telling us that, in fact, tropical world is the lungs of the world. So we should be the carbon sinks that is in the CO2 and all that. I understand all those issues. But whether we like it or not, they have lived from this and in this, <laughs> they are still spewing out those gases that is even as we speak. Making that climate, aggravating the climate. So I'm very happy that President Biden has returned the U.S. of A to the uh, Paris Accord because they were one of the key abusers on the, on the planet. That said, as a minister in Ghana being a small country, I believe that whether we like it or not, climate change is real. And there's a limit to what we can do. That is why in one of the questions that we should develop climate smart systems so that we can survive as a nation. But more importantly, we demand from those countries as of right that they should do environmental restitution. And if Ghana, Nigeria, DRC and whatnot, we are the carbon sinks of this world, the lungs of this world, then we should receive recompense for that. It doesn't have to come in the form of money. It can be technological assistance to beat this same same climate change and to assist it. And this thing can be costing. And in fact, they have a moral obligation to do that. So that is my take on that. It's not a binary issue. You cannot say that for them or against them. Thank you, sir. Very well. Okay, Eric. Eric is not ready. Yes, Honorable. Honorable nominee, you have already spoken about um, plastic waste management, but um, I'd like to find out from you, given the fact that um, plastic is a persistent pollutant which poses grave danger to our soil, a Greek, when ruminants feed on plastic, they, they, they die. I'd like to know from you whether you would not consider an outright ban on plastic, the importation, manufacture, and distribution of plastic, like the Rwandans have done. Today, if you go to Rwanda, it's one of the cleanest cities because they have banned the distribution, manufacture, and importation of plastic. Mr. Chairman, ban plastics or not? That's a, a very difficult one. 
as a new minister entering the scientific arena, I have to immerse myself and listen to all the conversation and the arguments and whatnot, the scientific basis, the data, and the economic basis pertaining to our situation before one makes that pronouncement. What I know is that we can certainly lessen our dependency on plastics and certain steps have been taken. We can also do recycling and all that. But whilst we are at it, we will have to monitor what other countries have done and their situation have, if they have lessons for us that we can copy. After all, we are living in an interdependent world. Then we may want to consider what they've done and see whether we can do. But for now, I do not have all the information that is available <laughs> to make such a categorical pronouncement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman. My second question has to do with the certification. Um, Ghana ratified the United Nations Convention to combat desertification in 1996. But ever since we signed and ratified that convention, it appears not much has been achieved in our uh, um, collective quest to deal with desertification. The hardest um, hit regions of the country is the northern regions, and this phenomenon has largely contributed to the north-south migration. So if you have Kaya here today, I mean, it's as a direct result of desertification in northern Ghana. If you are given the nod, what would you do to ensure that the UN Convention is fully implemented in our country to root out or at least control desertification in our country? Mr. Chairman, again... The question even begs another question. It, it is not lost on anybody that desertification is a phenomenon which is which threatens our very livelihoods and even our very lives. And we were just talking about climate change and or oh, desertification. If you take away the trees, that the uh, flora. You generate carbon dioxide and you contribute to the CO2 in the uh, atmosphere. So the question for combating desertification, we do not even need an international treaty to see for ourselves that it is something that we must do. Having said that, it means all the activities that generate potential desertification, we must attack them. And this one demands also intersectorial approach, land use policy, agricultural lands, the sort of tree crops that we plant, the our the technology that we use to do tropical agriculture, all those things will have to be looked at, and the necessary policies and the necessary programs and the necessary technologies that will stop the certification will have to be, uh, you know, looked at so that we can fight it. So, yes, as a minister, I know that it is a big issue, and I happen to have toured uh, the, the northern <laughs> regions of this country. But I tell you, it is not even a phenomenon which is peculiar to the northern regions of this country. At the turn of the century, where I hail from, it was all forest land. Now they have been thinned out so that, again, my favorite crop, I noticed that cocoa is migrating south. Bia east, the Bia districts. Cocoa does not thrive well there. Now it's cashew, who does well there. So it's all, it's, 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 it's a spectrum which is coming south, you know, down south. So we must fight and do the necessary 
ecological restitution in a very holistic way. And that's why we have to look at policies and programs and then look at the various sectorial actors so that we can act in concert to stop this. Okay, now leaders. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable nominee, this is just an aside. Just going through um, preparing for this, I came across an article that put you as one that lists you as one of the richest men in Ghana. I came across an article that listed you as one of the richest men in Ghana. And I, 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 I wonder if you will uh, want to make a comment on that. But my question relates to CSIR and the Ghana uh, Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, the CSIR, for example, I do know, uh, seem to be running out of researchers and scientists due to either retirement or poor remuneration. And I'm sure it is agreed that uh, after uh, Osajipo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966, uh, science, technology, and innovation seem to have uh, gone down, especially as the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission was supposed to lead the way. I'm just thinking if you have thought about these two institutions and the role that they can play in STI and what you intend to do, especially uh, given the fact that these institutions seem to be running out of the necessary human resource that is required to drive whatever vision that led to their establishment as a result of either retirement or poor remuneration. Mr. Chairman, again, another difficult area because the determinants of this problem are many. It starts with training even in the, especially the secondary schools, because if you do not have a critical mass of numbers, that will take the science-based subjects in the universities, who will then apply themselves in the applied science arena, where essentially this CSIR and the uh, GAEC are, those are applied sciences. They, they, they have a base where they, they feed from, so to speak, they feed from. So the problem should be looked at the scientific culture, and we have answered this previously, and have given an affirmation that yes, we work with education so that we have that critical mass. I even went to give a ratio that in, uh, in secondary institutions, the science to the humanities should be in the ratio of maybe 60, 70 percent to 30. And indeed, everybody should have even a science basic, like the U.S. system, a school Arabic in the U.S., so that everybody has an appreciation of what is happening up to a certain level. And when we branch into those specialties, indeed in the universities, then the sciences, especially those critical areas that are needed, that's why we have to have an incentive mechanism, scholarships, to go into specific areas. Then, following that, you cited remuneration. If we put our value on it, and that they are, and we link them to industry, I'm sure they are, they are remuneration, and the recompense for them will be up. And that is why we will retain. Because when we even we train those people, it is not that people do not want to branch in those fields, but in fact they leave further afield into especially the developed world where salaries are better. But at least we can make an effort. And it is the only way we can do that is to link them to the productive industries so that we can retain them. All right, um, landfill sites. Um, I wish that could be my uh, substantive question, but um, I'm sure it will come up. So let me um, go to controversial um, 
assessments that have been done of members of parliament. Um, one that was recently done by the University of Ghana and another that was done by Odikro some time ago did not uh, capture you favorably uh, by way of uh, attendance to uh, uh, your duties as a member of parliament and that's why I refer to them as controversial reports because I am aware of the controversy those reports generated but both reports did not capture you favorably uh, given the role and the tax that you are expected to perform as minister of environment uh, what what can you say about this past you know, research reports that did not show uh, that commitment that is required uh, of one who is representing a constituency in this house. Well, I, Mr. Chairman, I wonder which report is referring to because in my first term I was a regional minister. And indeed, if you ask the majority leader, Honorable Oseche Mensa, I have occasion that he had always praised me that I always made an effort to be in attendance. So I'm very, very, very amazed. That research, their methodology <laughs> should be questioned because indeed I came, uh, I made sure that I had the right balance between visits to my constituency, the ministerial duties at the regional level. And remember, that was a time we were canvassing for a region, for the Western North. So those reports, and they, 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 I, honestly, they, they are very unscientific. So, so honestly, I do not. But to answer you specifically, my ministerial duties and my attendance in parliament you want to place a bet me i am one person who puts a lot of premium on my parliamentary because there is a history behind me nobody has suffered to become a minister an mp more than me so i don't joke with my mp duties and everybody will attest to that so I, I do not know where the God that came from. I was given a specific duty to midwife a region into being Western North where I came from. I turned in with all the girls to that I could. So if I didn't get a balance right vis-a-vis -vis attendance, that should not be a yes thing for anybody to make projections. Well, you can only know how much you have suffered. You cannot know how much others you have suffered. So to declare yourself as the one who has suffered the most is quite interesting. But uh, finally on landfill sites, I have one in my constituency that is very, very disturbing. I see the uh, folds around Kula in my constituency, uh, around the landfill sites sometimes trying to work a living, even as they uh, face the uh, dangers that are associated with spillage and other toxic materials that come uh, from these landfill sites. Uh, the controversy has always been really under whose control are these landfill sites, local government ministry and all the sanitation ministry. Uh, yet these are, you know, uh, these have effects on the environment and the people who live in those uh, communities. I want to uh, find out what your approach will be, uh, as especially other countries have long moved away from these landfill sites as ways of disposing uh, uh, waste. Mr. Chairman, I'll give you previous responses. A combination of technology, legislation, sociology. Let me explain. Landfill sites. We are saying we are moving away from it. Yes, it's tied into recycling. And the recycling agenda lies partly with us, EPA and others. So we will 
make sure that we up our game and get the capacity for recycling. Recently, when the president went around doing the campaign, you, you are sure that you had a several places where recycling of waste material is going to be done to generate, uh, you know, fertilizers. And, right? In fact, waste material actually is a resource if well handled. So we we'll look at that. But we are talking about capacity issues. We might not be able to do it in every place. And we are transitioning from landfills to recycling. In that, as far as that is concerned, it means whilst we are in transit, certain laws must be enforced. And I have said notice that after talking to even our own entities, the EPA should not shy away from sending entities, not individuals. Of course, individuals can be sent to court. But I want to see an example being made, and I mentioned a couple of them. Entities, yes, government agencies, we should collaborate first. But if there is a sure dereliction of duty, and an entity is sent to court, I don't want to mention an, an example, the CEO of that entity, I'm sure, will fall, I'm sure, by even public suasion, will be forced to do what is needful. So we should say, I will not, uh, I can consider that uh, anger. But on the other hand, we believe that uh, the way to go is recycling, really, so that we can make use of the waste and turn them into other things. Thank you. Are you really worth $180 million? Are you really worth $180 million? Well, I don't know where that thing is coming from. <laughs> I don't know. I refuse to. At least I've not been cited for, uh, for a public text. <laughs> but what matters is that you are a very serious farmer. I'm hearing here that you, you cultivate nutmegs. When people import them from elsewhere, you cultivate them here. That's very commendable. Yes, Honorable Minister Nomei. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a follow-up to the last response the nominee gave on um, landfill sites and recycling. Source separation of waste, separating our garbage at source to promote recycling. Is it something that you would consider um, promoting? Waste is also exported to other countries. Some Scandinavian countries actually import waste to feed their recycling industry. So if we manage this space properly, it could be a major um, import earner for Ghana. Would you look at um, source separation of waste and all that is required for it, legislation, public education and all that? Thank you. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, two questions, two things that uh, Honorable Slavuso has had. Source separation, yes, absolutely. We must do it, separate the solids and the biodegradables from the non degradable. But it's a cultural phenomenon. It's a cultural phenomenon. We have to do education so that it is embedded in the public polity. So it, it is something that we have to train people to imbibe and do. So the education will have to go in thing. And indeed, uh, where I come from, for example, feeding ruminants, can you imagine, let me go even further, plantain peels, if we, 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 we buy from the markets and we buy the, what we are going to use today and maybe tomorrow, in the peeled form, and they are packaged for you, leave the peels behind in the markets, we can aggregate them, cut them into pieces, and feed ruminants. We are going to gain. So this thing doesn't take exotic science to do this. So that's what I mean by sociology and culture. So all these things are not even science. So we can do that, madam. And then export of waste. Well, we have to look at it. Because if what we are saying is true, we may end up even uh, being a net importer of waste, even from our geographical region. Those countries will hopefully be 
we have the capacity to generate energy, uh, fertilizer, and other things, products from waste. Then I can see Ghana importing from Cote d'Ivoire to go and add waste. So, well, if in the interim we have to export because we don't have the capacity, we have to look at the economics of it and then give the necessary permits for that to be done. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would like the nominee to tell us what he will do to assist the EPA, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, to strengthen its monitoring and evaluation and enforcement to follow up on whether the permits recipients are abiding by their conditions of their permits. I mean, people in the mining, telecommunications, forestry, oil and gas, and many other sectors need an EPA's permit to be able to conduct their activities. But after the permits are issued, what is done to monitor the implementation to ensure that they are actually being applied? The, the consequential question is, uh, you know, that place there is some echo problem there, you can hear uh, very well. What is that, what is being done, please can you help me? What would you do to assist the Environmental Protection Agency to strengthen its monitoring and evaluation of the permits that they've actually issued? to those who apply for those permits, whether in telecommunications, mining, forestry, oil and gas sector, and to enforce the conditions of their own legislation. After the permits are issued, do they follow up to ensure that they are actually abiding by the terms of those permits? And what would you do to assist them to strengthen the mechanisms to enforce their own legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The permits have expiration dates. To one of the issues is that some of them, once the permits are issued, let me admit that there's no follow-up, and even though we might have the data, to see that they are renewed. Then the other problem is, uh, you know, capacity issue in terms of uh, human resource. The EPA is very, very thin in the, on the ground in the regions and their districts. In fact, when I, before I came here, naturally I contacted the heads of the various agencies, and one of the issues that came up was that they have a, a problem with uh, recruiting staff into that area. So yes, we have to build their capacity so that they have the necessary skills even to inspect them, but also we have to put boots on the ground in terms of numbers at the operational level, because invariably these activities happen in their districts. So that is what I intend to Because if they do not monitor to see whether the, the, the entities are operating in accordance with the law, then it's as if they are operating only from their offices. And the mischief that this is intended to solve would still be uh, perpetrated. Now, noise pollution is also environmental pollution, and it can even cause mental health challenges for us, particularly in these areas when people are locked down and can't have um, other activities to take their minds off the challenges that we're facing with COVID and all of that. Our churches, mosques, nightclubs, bars in residential areas are the main sources of some of this noise pollution. What are you going to do to ensure that we minimize the scourge, which may even be affecting our health? The chairman, noise pollution is a big and very difficult area. But that said, it doesn't mean we should not enforce the laws of the land. Because of our cultural settings, there's resistance from certain segments of society with regard to noise. So we have to, we will embark on 
massive public education as far as noise pollution is concerned. And in certain instances, give uh, ultimatums and then enforce the law. I believe that as a physician, I know that, like she rightly pointed out, noise pollution is a very, very important problem in this country, but we do not appreciate it. So we should put in place systems that can even measure, because we have simple implements that can measure the number of decibels that we've gone over, but unless we have that capacity to you know, measure all those things. And I notice that we do not have a lot of them in place. So we have to get the law. The law is there, but we, consequential legislation will have to be reviewed. And then, more importantly, embark on massive education nationwide so that we come to a point where people themselves will see the severity of the problem and be self-compliant, but then in those instances where people are recalcitrant, we enforce the law. My final question is, um, what are you going to do to promote science, technology, education, and mathematics, uh, engineering and mathematics he, he has answered that question. and training for girls? He's answered that he question. He has answered that question. For girls? Yes. Okay, thank you. On STEM. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you very much. Chairman, I'm I'm, I'm really constrained with time because it's time for uh, Friday prayers. I hope prayers start soon. Yeah, I, I, I can see that you're also praying that it starts soon. So I may be grateful if the nominee will just take my questions and then I can run out, if you don't mind. I'm hoping that you may ask the full house for me. I have a number of questions that... I have a number of questions that relate to land encroachment with regards to CSR, that's the uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, there are lands across this country are really, really being encroached. And you've served as the Minister for Lands and uh, Forestry before, so I'm sure you are very much familiar with this. And in some instances, they are finding it very difficult to get the Land Commission to assist them to hold on to their lease. That will help them to be able to protect this what will you do to curb this? And second has to do with innovation. I mean, in an early answer to your question, there yeah, you try to explain. We all know the importance of innovation and research work. But the current funding mechanism, if it continues, then I'm sorry, very soon nobody will be interested in, I mean, uh, working on any research work. What innovative measures will you put in place to ensure that there's some funding, dedicated funding, to support uh, innovation in the development of our country. And Mr. Chairman, the last group of questions that I have has to do with the GMO, that's the genetically modified f food. I just want to know your position on it and what is your views on all the talk about GMO. Also, you know, sorry, that Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, since 2012, has been researching into GMO cowpea that in their uh, work believe that it has the potential to curb the Maruka pest destruction. They have currently even applied to the National Biosafety Authority for, to enable them release this uh, crop into the general population. But unfortunately, the Minister for Greek Food and Agriculture on 14th March 2019, when he met the development partners, had this to say that Ghana does not need GMO to ensure food sufficiency and security. What is your view on this? I know that Professor Frempon Barton, your predecessor, has presented before this House a regulation on biosafety, on biosafety. Whilst this is happening, unfortunately you have the Minister of Agriculture has a different view. As a 
medical doctor yourself, and knowing very well that you've been in this area for long, can you say that GMOs are 100% safe for consumption for which Ghana should allow them to test that, even though I know we've done the biosafety law already. And Mr. Chairman, lastly, as you proceed to the Ministry of Environment, if this house gives you the opportunity, will you encourage CSI to continue its push on more research on GMOs, possibly against the views of the lack of the Minister for Agric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope that uh, probably, Mr. Chairman, you help me with the follow-ups. If the answers we have to run to. Uh, Chairman, he has to go for Friday prayers. I would have to stay with the Honorable uh, Tampule. It means you are also going. Okay, I'm obliged to support Chairman. But whilst I'm answering where is need for Chairman for me to come in on a follow-up, I will. And I trust that the leadership on this side will allow me also. I'm not late yet. If I take my questions, I still can join in the mox, which is around 130, 135. Thank you. Yeah, then I will know. You may take them one by one and be as short as possible. Mr. Chairman, land encroachment. These are legal issues. We have to find out. I will have to find out what are the real issues. If we have to have recourse to the law, we will do that and take back, back the land. That's the answer. Funding for innovation, I think I've answered in several questions that are, and I, uh, I even call for a decade of innovation and it's undeserved funding from industry and end users and the private sector and how government should be set up a dedicated fund. So I've answered that. The GMO position, again, there are several issues in there. And to force the minister to take a position is not fair. I happen to know that the issues are not even about biosafety issues. But the ability to conserve your gene uh, pool, the variation, because the potential to, uh, to make us genetically dependent on outside us, and it has implication even for our national security. These are the real issues, but it is not even the biological safety, so to speak. Because my God, a lot of GMOs are, are safe. They are safe. That as a scientist, I would say that it would be in the USA, they use a lot of genetically modified entities, and as far as I'm concerned, their mortalities are as simple. But inbuilt there is the safety and the, the economics, because some of them have patented some of these things, and if you become very reliant on them, it means your genetic pool, you lose them forever, and if there's a catastrophe, you cannot go back to those things that were native to your environment. Again, if some of these things should escape into the environment, they can actually replicate themselves and populate your nation and change the flora and fauna of your nation. So where there are experts out there, we have to listen to them and see what can be done. But having said that, there are several things, researches that have improved local varieties that we are, they are sitting on shelves, which can give comparable results to GMO uh, identified entities that we have not even used, that I have talked to before. And then he asked about Sari. Uh, he's not here, I've forgotten. Savannah? Yes, yeah, Savannah Agricultural Research Institute. He says, uh, as it ran down, I forgot the question that they are undertaking some small studies. Will you encourage them and oh, find as them for the studies, they can take a permit from EPA, and if it's certified, there's always a committee on GMO. And if all the biosafety precautions are taken, studies are permitted. So they Will you support them to undertake those studies? Pardon? Will you support them to undertake those studies? 
as That's minister, what I'm saying. that the law even permits those studies to be done. As to their wide application, because before even you get a permit to do those studies, there is a committee, I've forgotten the uh, official name of the committee, but there's always a local entity, a uh, committee of scientists, which make sure that those entities will not escape into the environment and cause all the pictures that I've pointed here to fall. But there is there. It doesn't mean that we cannot, uh, at the research level, uh, deal with GMOs. It is only when you want to deploy on commercial basis that we have a, a lot of issues there, and I've enumerated them. And then, uh, that is all. Council for, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, he asks for your view on a particular matter on it. On particular? Your view on Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Yes. The land encroachment issue I've, I've, I've said, and then it apply, it's applicable to uh, the um, Kabinya, what do you call it? Uh, Ghana Atomic Energy, GAEC 2. So there are land issues there. But we have to look at the law. I mean, the law is the law. So if people have encroached and we have to deal with them, Minister, I will be Minister designate, your answer is specific. You've used Kwabinya. The Honorable Muntaka wanted to find out that across the country, there is unacceptable encroachment on all Council for Scientific and Industrial Research land. What will you do if you become Minister to halt the unacceptable practice? He, he has answered that one. That was what he answered first, yes. So the legal matters, so you look at the legal matters. But, Chairman, legal matters is not enough. You have your land, they are taking it. You should tell us what you do to secure those oh, lands. Preventive one, those in account, say, the more the normal you call, the account, you have a more combined. That one step we will take. Now, then those that the are gone, we will say, the Oka and the Metias here translated. To which uh, uh -huh. those that are lost, we will, we will draw a perimeter around those that are not lost, so we secure them. And then those that have been taken, we will go and use the necessary legal instruments to retrieve them. Yeah, yes. good. Uh, um, I'll try and be brief. Doc, um, come with me to environmental impact assessment and a huge requirement and you know it's a basic requirement for setting up a number of uh, setups in this country now in one of my thesis it came out clearly that the EPA often subcontracts uh, the pursuit of e uh, environmental impact assessment to private banks and then often it turns out that it compromised. What will you do under your leadership to ensure that we don't compromise the conduct of environmental impact assessment? Mr. Chairman, these are moral issues, moral hazards. So we have to put in place a mechanism. Those private entities who do that, either personnel or organizations, of our books and we do not deal with them. And then indeed, if there are avenues for sanctioning, we will take that recourse. But certainly, uh, as a believer in, in the private sector collaboration, I don't think we have to, because of that uh, reason, we have to not deal with the private sector. I only uh, I, I decried the death of uh, uh, personnel, <laughs> you know, that we know how. Then, on the other hand, to we, we even you cannot say in absolute uh, certain terms that even the public personnel there in the public service they might be any better. So, um, the carbon trade concept, which is hugely advocated globally and developing can, developed countries have taken huge advantage and in our part of the world we seem to be lacking behind because of capacity. 
what is your own assessment of our drive towards building our capacity to buy into the carbon trade concept and also rake in the necessary benefits to our country? Well, the carbon trade center has been beset with a lot of problems. You know, I don't want to mention some countries' needs, but I have been issued certain countries thought that it was the potential for a rip off from the developed world to the developing world existed. And they were contesting some of the issues there and the assignments that had been made in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, values that have been put on certain activities. But that said, we also have a problem with tapping into that thing because of, uh, 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 it's a, a highly technical issue. So I don't know what is happening in my ministry. If the technical impediments in terms of capacity to uh, right or uh, apply with the, within the necessary format and whatnot. If we are we, able to do that, then I will look at it and then make sure that Mesti does it so that Ghana will, will be able to assess the fund. But my understanding is that there are certain countries who do not even as a matter of principle agree to that arrangement. And I don't want to mention one big country that has been mentioned here to fall before. But that said, the real issue, let me repeat, is that it's a highly technical area and we need very, very technically competent people who are very conversant in the area so that your paper will even, or submissions will even be accepted in the first place. That's the brief that I, I got. But when I get there, there will, will, will be other issues. So when I get there, we, we, we will have to look at it. And then I suspect our country might also be, be too keen to assess it for various reasons. Because you have to also uh, come out with certain pre, there are preconditions to attach to it. So we have, it's a big problem. So maybe we'll have the conversation in detail some other time. But my last question is related to e-waste. I'm aware uh, Germans have been helping us. If you go to Abu Bushi now, there have been a number of interventions to get at top uh, concerns about e-waste. I know you are also concerned and passionate about this. Do you have any predetermined programs or plans to deal with e-waste in our country? Indeed, let me give credit to my predecessor. There are a, 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 a very, very elaborate plans in Mesti now. Some of them, like I'm saying, might even need legislative backing. Uh, and the others, the, the, the programs will have, naturally everything evolves. So when I get there, I have to look at it. And then if there are any gaps there, and if the any level that I'll have to take it to, I'm certainly interested in that area, and we will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm done. Um, Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Honourable Member, what's the full name of your constituency? The constituency, how do you call it? Uh, we also. How many polling stations do you have? 100 and 68. So is it true that a ballot box was burned at coalition in the last elections? Well, I heard reports that I was not a witness to that. Wasn't burned, was snatched and destroyed. Was a mob went into it and they, they destroyed it. Ah, okay. So your, okay. So your collator resource was less than ballot box. Pardon? Your collector resource was less than ballot box. No. Ah, okay. Uh, it's, appreciate, it's appreciated. Yes. I, I, I enjoy your death intellectually, but Minister for Environment, the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission have major constraints, indeed financial constraints, 
they cannot even afford payment of subscription to SKA and then they too loss of their land are lost they are also suffering problems of encouragement this is captured in the handing over notes of your outgoing minister what will you do to address these matters thank you well then i will have to honor its international obligations and agreements that have been entered to so yes i read it from the news too so i have to find the nature of the problem and then uh, negotiate with the minister of finance or whatever entity that france are going to come from and pay up we simply have no choice we have to pay up thank you uh chairman thank you i would lump it up plant genetic genetic resources research institute Savannah Research Institute, Sarale, Nyangpala, Soya Research Institute, Kwada Sukumasi, Water Research And then they all generally have problems. What will you do about it so that they are efficient in the delivery which is the undertake? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear that they were having pro they are having problem with Staffing. 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 Yes. Uh, experience and skilled staff for those uh, research institutes, as I mentioned. So, Chairman, I believe this question has been asked in a global way, albeit in a global way before. <laughs> we were losing a lot of researchers. And I've said that we have to link those uh, institutes to industry so that their IGF could be up and uh, some arrangements should be made so that their salaries and other uh, remunerations could be competitive to uh, their peers elsewhere. Now, of course, I also have to appeal to my government if we are going to make science and technology and innovation, the fulcrum under which uh, Ghana's socioeconomic development revolves, that we put a premium on those people and their experience and whatnot should also count. I noticed that the Minister for Labor, I listened to that, he was calling for extension of, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, the retirement age. Those things must also be factored in so that the, 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 because we are living longer and I don't want to be into his space. But if they must make a case for it, these are the people that we need so that we do not go, so to speak, on a premature retirement and they have the opportunity to earn extra income. Chairman, for instance, I'm referring to handing over notes, the CSIR. Uh, in page 70 of it is currently operating with a staff strength of 2,728 which is woefully inadequate to choose their wares and that despite technical clearance granted in 20, 2019 some 158 staff were recruited but they still think that they've lost a number of staff to retirement. Will you replace and make sure they have their full complement of staff? Thank you, Chair. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I also see, and uh, it's unfortunate that Ghana is yet to take advantage of it. Oil palm, palm kernel. You hear everybody talk about Malaysia, the Malaysia miracle, and they are doing well. What are we doing, and what will you do as minister to ensure that we export this in large quantities? Thank you. Based on improved research and improved quality production of those products. Mr. Chairman, indeed, Ghana is importing oil, oil palm products. 
so our capacity is very uh, constrained. But like the Honorable Committee uh, right there, so to speak, as we still have capacity to make up on those deficits. And that is through improved varieties. A lot of farmers are not planting improved varieties. So the potential is there. But this one, I have to collaborate with the Minister for Agri and other entities so that this thing can be uh, fastened out and rolled out. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, FARA, is headquartered in Accra by some agreements signed in October 2003, specifically October 14. The government of Ghana signed an agreement with your ministry. Has that agreement been ratified by parliament in accordance with Article 75 of the 1992 Constitution? Mr. I cannot recall. Uh, there are so many activities <laughs> in the legal program. Should you get to the ministry? So I have to find out if it has not, then of course I'll find Should you get to the ministry and it's not been ratified? When should we expect you referring it to Parliament for ratification? After doing all the necessary checks and what I should believe that within the so even if my necessary work takes you two, three, four years, we should be waiting for you. I need certainty of time because it's been signed. The headquarters is here. They are helping the country with their work and their research. Give me a date that you will come to Parliament for us to do what is constitutionally needful. Mr. Chairman, I believe that we have, as I sit here, that's why I say I don't know its status. But I'm asking myself, why has it not come? There surely must be some problem. And I intend finding out. But barring every constraint, I believe that when we look at the way things work in our country within 90 days, it should be able to come here. But you know that the president is sending you there to solve problems not to go and know the problems, but to solve them. So that's why I want a definite response from you. Will you solve the problem and get the agreement ratified? Then, after all, what will be the legal basis of us engaging in that relationship? I believe I've given a response. I believe that an intelligent girl should be within three months. Now, to the Honorable Black, I referred you to the United Nations uh, Climate uh, Decision, UN General Assembly 2019, and you know that because of the past U.S. President uh, politics which was not based on multilateralism. The U.S. as a major player took some unilateral decisions, which I heard you say that President Barney has promised to do. The commitment by developing countries, including Ghana, are we not just a consequence of their actions? And what will you do so that we become a major player? I mean, we talk about the matter of carbon emission. Do you have an idea how much Ghana contributes to that? Carbon emission. Well, as a percentage of the, our, uh, 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 in the global standard, I don't think we contribute much. I, I used to have a figure in my head, honestly, but I do not want to put a figure that I can also substantiate it. Well, I, I saw 40 something million to be. As uh, chairman, the president was so determined to fight illegal mining popularly referred to as Gallam say there was Operation Vanguard which in my view was legal there was your ministry also taking another group referred to as Operation Halt which was working with the Forestry Commission the other one uh, the Minister for Interior and the Minister for Defense when you assume office as Minister Will you rationalize and make sure that we have 
unity of focus in the fight against Galamse. If we need to deploy the security agencies, you will not be working at cross purposes with your counterparts as defense and interior. Indeed so, Mr. Chairman. And as far as I'm concerned, some of these entities have been, been withdrawn. So we have a clean sheet to which to start. Now the Environmental Protection Agency of your ministry, they need also staffing support, they need technical support for capacity. But the Ghanaian community or various communities in Ghana are complaining about two electromagnetic effects. One with telecom towers and its sighting and the consequence of lack of public education for them to appreciate how that impacts on their life. The second is fuel stations. You just have a community, then all you see is a fuel station coming out in a neighborhood that they get frustrated and they don't get what you call institutional support that supports the protection of their lives. What will you do about it? Mr. Chairman, the electromagnetic phenomena, I understand the scientific community, there is even not a consensus on the damage that is done to the human person and for living organism. That said, as a doctor, I will err on the side of safety. But we EPA will have to conduct a scientific study the Ghanaian situation and come with recommendations. I understand steps have been taken in that direction. I don't know what stage they are now. I think it is being done by the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. Fuel stations, the, the story with fuel stations is a bit difficult. Built in built up areas, there are others too who set up and then the community or the built up area, so to speak, also uh, um, go to them in the sense that there are specific distances that they should uh, 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 keep away. I'm not sure, even is there regard to, when you talk of fuel stations, the law with regard to petrol stations is a bit different from the gas stations. So uh, we have to disaggregate the two. The, my understanding is that the fuel uh, uh, stations uh, can be closer to communities than some. Uh, that's the gas, petrol, uh, diesel station, the liquid gas, can be closer to communities than we care to, apart from public places like churches, mosques, schools, where you cannot build petrol stations. Indeed, the law is that if you are a private entity and you are uh, living close to even sharing a wall with petrol stations, it's not against the law. That's one thing I found out. If we have to change it, we have to change the law. But with regard to gas stations, there's a definite distance that one, it must be away from all built up areas. That one, I forgot in the absolute distance, but I can find out. That much I know. But again, which came first? Some people obey the law and build, and build their gas stations far away from built-up areas. And here it is rather the built-up areas which encroach and got near to the gas stations. And here they cry foul. So the narrative is not as simple as people make them out to be. Chairman, the Minister, you are given one side of the narrative. I agree with you on that leg. But there is the other narrative where homes are invaded or the EPA issues are licenses and what those citing up the fuel and gas station is to hold the EPA license and say that we've been authorized to be here but the community is saying that we have not been engaged sufficiently or we do not agree with EPA going ahead with this activity. What will you do about that? Mr. Chairman, that's why I'm saying that with regard to diesel and petrol, look at the law. <laughs> if they, they can be permitted to build right to hopes, but schools must... For, so if the law is by, we can change it. So they, they can cry foul, and I sympathize with them, but sympathy is different from law. 
Then, but when you're talking about gas station, that is another category, and I think I've explained already. Uh, chairman, I love eating sweet potatoes, and in Ghana, we don't even encourage its eating. Uh, Chama had a bite of it this morning. I see as part of the research, very different types of research going into expanded production of it. It is something that we easily can export to improve our foreign exchange regime, and it's something we can encourage is eating, uh, even in our domestic uh, economy. What will you do to give meaning to the research finance on sweet potatoes in Ghana. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe that we have to collaborate with the Minister of Agri. That is where Mercy and Agri should put their money. The sweet potato is very nutritious, contains protein content compared to pure flour. And we should do our advertisement and promote consumption of that. In fact, we can incorporate it into flour in a certain ratio so we can make it into bread. But we have to train our taste buds to get used to it so that people will patronize them. Even before we talk about export, yes, the export potential too is there. So I agree with you entirely, and that is where we can even improve farmers' incomes and help them out of poverty. Chairman, my final question to the minister is, Ghana now has the advantage of producing oil and gas. Is there an environmental policy relating to oil and gas resources, its exploitation in our country? And what will you do if you become Minister for Environment on this matter? Mr. Chairman, indeed there is a policy, a cited drug policy, in various stages of development. I forget which stage it has reached. So that would be one of my duties to make that it comes, uh, the, we get the necessary things done and it comes to Parliament as soon as possible if le legislation is needed so that we can uh, uh, deploy its long overdue. Will your ministry conduct some need study? Solar, I know it's largely driven by policy by the Ministry of Energy in Ghana. But you are responsible for the environment. If you take from Navrungo, coming through Bolga, through Nasia, Savlogo to Tamale, as you have traveled extensively abroad, whether you are in Germany or you are in Switzerland, you see those uh, solar uh, things which uses like an electric fan. Uh, I don't know the technical meaning for it. My view will be that we should begin de developing that kind of environmental friendly infrastructure to support the solar regime in Ghana. Can you give me an assurance, Minister Designate? Ghana being in the tropical world, the potential for solar energy is huge. The only problem is the economics of it and the economics of it. Well, how they deployed solar panels in Germany might be acceptable there. We should have a national dialogue. Whichever configuration is able to harvest the energy, that is a, our primary concern. Whether rooftops, whether we put in them our garages, whether on standalone entities, whether in farms where we can even do, because some certain plants even need shading and when they are well spaced, you can even harvest them, especially in rural electrification settings. That one, we have to have a conversation and dialogue and a closure on that. Chairman, so that thank you, and I wish the nominee well. Honorable nominee, well, I only wish to put this on record that your life is a reflection of somebody who is prepared to acquire the knowledge, dirty your hands to achieve results. I wish you well in this new enterprise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all members. I appreciate what has happened today. I'm so you're, grateful. You're discharged. You hear from us. Uh, I hear that the funds I spoke about is called Wind Vase. Eh? Thank you.
Honourable okay. members, we resume at 2.30. Okay. Inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. It's going to be fun to see how he goes about approaching this game.
powers and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. 